In doing the research for my last video, who was in the National Statuary Hall, Part 5, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, and Massachusetts, there were two topics I encountered that really grabbed my attention, and I started to research these two topics as independent subjects. The first topic I had decided to call 1871 Eyes Wide Open because I already knew from past research that significant historical events in our current timeline took place in 1871, and I uncovered some more events through my research into the National Statuary Hall that happened in or around 1871 to add to the list. In particular, the beginning of Mardi Gras in 1871 in Galveston, Texas, and the establishment of Shriners International in 1870. I had already started to do the research for the first topic when the second topic grabbed my attention. Calling it of plantations and partitions and the planned destruction of civilization, this topic came to the surface as a result of researching John Winthrop, one of the leading figures in the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the early colonization process called plantation. It did not take me long to realize these two topics were related and that it made sense to merge them into this one video and simply call it Eyes Wide Open. My name is Michelle Gibson. I'm going to start with the Moors because everything that has happened is really about what happened to them and what happened to them has been happening in real time to all of us. So all of this is completely relevant to what is happening today. I will take you through the information I have come across which has brought me to these conclusions. The Moors have been almost completely removed from the history of civilization, with the exception of roughly 800 years in Spain. And we are not taught anything about an ancient global unified Moorish civilization dating back to ancient Mu or Lemuria, that continued on through Atlantis up until relatively recently in time, much more recently than one would think. The architecture and infrastructure of this ancient civilization is still all over the world, and still in use today, though much has already been destroyed. Since this is not in our historical narrative, we don't even think to question what we are told about it being built by someone else. The thing is, this ancient civilization, and civilization as we know it, is still under attack and being destroyed every single day. Its earthworks are being destroyed every day in road and housing construction. It is being destroyed in big city riots. It is being destroyed by public policies that destroy lives and property, and public policies that encourage lawlessness and it has been destroyed by world wars and civil wars, and demolished for reasons given like urban renewal, deterioration, and safety. This has all been part of a plan and is not happening by chance, though that is what we have been taught to believe. What might that plan be? Is the intention of the plan displayed for all to see on the back of the $1 Federal Reserve note, the currency of the United States? There are two sides of the Great Seal of the United States. On one side is the National Coat of Arms, and among other symbolism, prominently depicts an eagle and the motto, E Pluribus Unum, or Out of Many, One. On the other side, an unfinished pyramid with an eye above it is depicted, as well as two more mottos. The motto above the pyramid with the eye says, Anuit Coeptus, which is taken to mean Providence, or God, favors our undertakings. The motto below is Novus Ordo Seclorum, which is commonly translated as New Order of the Ages. The Roman numerals at the bottom of the pyramid is the year 1776. This is what we are told about the origins of the Great Seal. Samuel Adams appointed William Barton of Philadelphia in 1782 to come up with a design proposal for the National Coat of Arms of the United States since he had a reputation for his knowledge of heraldry. Barton called his design, Device for an Armorial Achievement for the United States of North America, blazoned agreeably in accordance to the laws of heraldry. Laws of heraldry? That one is new to me, so I looked into it, and this is what came up. 
The laws of heraldic arms governs the bearing of arms, which is the possession, use, or display of arms, also called coat of arms. According to the law of arms, coats of arms, and other similar emblems may only be borne by one ancestral right or descent from an ancestry through the male line, or two, a grant made to the user under due authority, like the state or the crown. Where have we heard about the right to bear arms before? There would appear to be some kind of connection between the use of the word arms to refer to both heraldry devices and weapons. We are told the Irish-born patriot Charles Thompson of Philadelphia finalized the design of the Great Seal of the United States, and it was he who added Anuit Queptus instead of Deo Fivente and Novus Ordo Seclorum. It is interesting to note that the final Great Seal of Thompson is an exact replica in design of the Great Seal of the Moors, with the differences being in the meanings of the inscriptions on each one. The single eye at the top of the pyramid in the Great Seal of the Moors represents reconnecting with our higher selves and divine natures, and not the all-seeing eye of the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati and Big Brother that it has come to be associated with. As you can see, symbols were co-opted from the original meanings, and the meaning of the symbols inverted and applied in a different context. The Moors are friends of humanity, with five principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. And are all about teachings to activate the pineal gland and about the human potential to reconnect to our higher selves and divine natures in this lifetime. Another important ordo is found in the Masonic motto of the 33rd degree, Ordo Ab Keo, and Deus meum que ius. It is found on the grand decorations of the Order of the Sovereign Grand Inspectors General of the Scottish Rite, one of the highest honors and roles which can be bestowed upon a Mason. It translates to Order Out of Chaos and God and My Right. And who exactly is their God? Was the meaning of order out of chaos simply about restoring order between divisions between the northern and southern jurisdictions of the Scottish Rite that took place in the early 1800s in North America, as some have speculated? Was it meant to draw forth order from the chaos of their own individual lives and minds? Was it a description of a yin and yang process of change in how the universe organizes itself, with order and chaos giving birth to one another, as others have speculated? Or was it an actual blueprint for sorcery and the plan for how the new world order was going to take over the world? Through the systematic application of the Hegelian dialectic of problem, reaction, solution? Here's a list I found of Hegelian dialectic methods of manipulation, which includes chaos sorcery. Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was a German philosopher who lived between 1770 and 1831. In his major work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel traced the formation of self-consciousness through history and the importance of other people. One of the titled subsections in the self-consciousness chapter of this book is Independent and Dependent Self-Consciousness, Lordship and Bondage. The common name for this passage is the Master-Slave Dialectic. The passage describes an encounter between what are two distinct self-conscious beings, with each becoming aware of the other. Self-consciousness forms as the result of the dialectic, or movement, of recognizing each other. This movement takes the form of a struggle to the death between the two self-conscious beings in which one masters the other, only to find out that the lordship, or mastery, is not possible because the bondsman, or slave in this state, is not free to offer it. This passage is a key element in Hegel's philosophical system and influenced later philosophers. It is interesting to note that I came across references to Tapping Reeve when I was researching historical figures 
represented by statues in the National Statuary Hall. Tapping Reeve was an early American lawyer, educator, and judge. If you break down the meaning of his unusual name as actual words in English, tapping can be defined as to exploit or draw a supply from a resource, and Reeve as administrator, attendant, curator, agent, director, and the list goes on. Something to think about. Tapping Reeve opened the Litchfield Law School in Litchfield, Connecticut in 1784, the first independent law school established in America for reading law and a proprietary school unaffiliated with any college or university. Tapping Reeve became Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court in 1814. Reef came to mind because of the title of the book he published in 1816. It was titled The Law of Baron and Femme, of Parent and Child, Guardian and Ward, Master and Servant, and the Powers of the Court of Chancery, with an essay on the terms heir, heirs, and heirs of the body. This became the premier American treatise on family law for much of the 19th century, with revisions and republication in 1846, 1867, and 1888. Hegel was considered one of the most important figures in German idealism that was linked with Romanticism and revolutionary politics. Romantic nationalism is the form of nationalism in which the state claims its political legitimacy as a consequence of the unity of those it governs including such factors as language, race, ethnicity, culture, religion, and customs. This was in opposition to dynastic or imperial rule. Here's background information on who some of the dynastic rulers were before I go further into the results of Romantic nationalism. First, a little bit about Elizabeth of Bohemia, who lived from 1596 to 1662. She was the daughter of Anne of Denmark, and King James VI of Scotland, and first of England, Scotland, and Ireland, of the Royal House of Stuart. These portraits of King James are both in existence. Notice the word Jacobus at the top of the portrait of him on the left. Elizabeth was the wife of Frederick V, who was the Elector Palatine of the Holy Roman Empire, and briefly the King of Bohemia, between 1619 and 1620. So she was briefly the Queen of Bohemia. Prior to the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire in August of 1806 as a result of Napoleon defeating the Austrian and Imperial forces in the Battle of Austerlitz in December of 1805, the Imperial throne of the Holy Roman Empire was occupied by the House of Habsburg. Also called the House of Austria, the House of Habsburg was one of the most distinguished and influential royal houses of Europe. The daughter of Elizabeth of Bohemia and Frederick V was Princess Sophia. Princess Sophia was the founder of the Hanoverian line of British monarchs, and through her mother, a descendant of the House of Stuart. Interestingly, Princess Sophia was born in 1630, which was the same year that the Massachusetts Bay Colony was established and the beginning of the plantation of New England. More about that later in this video. The Stone of Scone, also known as the Stone of Destiny, and Jacob's Pillow Stone, has been used for centuries in the coronation of Scottish monarchs, and later when the Scottish monarchs became English monarchs, and is an ancient symbol of Scottish sovereignty. When not being used for the coronation ceremonies of British monarchs at Westminster Abbey in London, it is kept on display in the Crown Room at Edinburgh Castle alongside the Crown Jewels. Who exactly was Jacob in the Bible? Jacob was the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham, and later received the name Israel. The tribes of Israel came into existence through his sons. What if there was a direct connection to the tribes of Israel found in the house of Stuart that is missing from collective awareness because that information, and all information about the tribes of Israel throughout the world, was deliberately removed? their fate coming down to us instead as the lost tribes of Israel. And at what point did the children of Israel become the Jews that we know today? The available information is that the Ashkenazic Jews are the Jews of France, Germany, and Eastern Europe, and their descendants, and that Ashkenaz is used in Hebrew to refer to Germany. Sephardic Jews are the Jews of Spain, Portugal, North Africa, and the Middle East and that the Hebrew word sephirod refers to Spain. 
and Mizrahi Jews, with Mizrahi meaning east and referring to Jews whose ancestors moved east instead of west. What if the tribes of Israel were part and parcel of the ancient, advanced, unified Moorish civilization that dates back to ancient Mu? These are some examples of the same eight-pointed star visible in the tribes of Israel graphic, just shown previously, found in diverse places. On the top left, a detail at the Mabel Tainter Memorial Theater in Menominee, Wisconsin, at the Gum Tea Memorial in Faisalabad, Pakistan, in the top middle, and on a book cover about the First Anglo-Afghan War on the top right, and on the bottom left, at the Moorish Kiosk in Mexico City, and on the bottom right, above the chandelier at an abandoned Lowe's Theater on Canal Street in New York City. The Great Exhibition of the Works of All Nations, held in the Crystal Palace in London in 1851, was also known as the Great Shalimar, a reference to the Mughal Garden Complex in Lahore, where you see the same eight-pointed star and similar design patterns in the Mughal Gardens on the left and on the Great Exhibition brochure on the right. What if there were empires within this civilization that were totally integrated with each other and not at war with each other as we have been taught? with examples of Tartaria in Asia, Barbaria in Africa, Washita in North America, and Mughal in India. At any rate, Princess Sophia, the granddaughter of the Stuart King James, was named heir presumptive to the thrones of England and Ireland by the 1701 Act of Settlement. The 1701 Act of Settlement was passed to settle the succession of the crowns of England and Ireland on Protestants only and their daughter, Princess Sophia, was the next Protestant in line for the throne. Princess Sophia of Hanover, however, died on June 8, 1714, before the death of Queen Anne on August 1, 1714, and Sophia's son became King George I on August 1, 1714. So this was when the German House of Hanover and the Georgian kings ascended to the British throne, through legitimate issue from the royal bloodline of the House of Stuart. In February of 1717, James Francis Edward Stuart of the House of Stuart, called the Pretender, who at one time was claimant to the throne, left where he was living in France to seek exile with Pope Clement XI in Rome, and he died in Rome in 1766. I found the portrait on the left of James Francis Edward Stuart, which was believed to have been painted of him while he was living in France, and on the right is the typical portrait of James Francis Edward Stuart. He was forcibly prevented from claiming the throne when he tried to do so in the Jacobite Uprising of 1715. In our historical narrative, the Jacobian era was the period in English and Scottish history that coincides with the reign of King James I and VI between the years of 1563 and 1625. More on happenings in 1717 shortly. Now back to the revolutions of 1830. One year before Hegel's death, these were romantic nationalist revolutions which led to the establishment of constitutional monarchies in France in 1830 with King Louis-Philippe I, and in 1831 with King Leopold I of Belgium, otherwise known as King of the Belgians. King Louis-Philippe I of the Habsburg House of Bourbon's cadet branch of the House of Orléans was the last king of France. He became king of France in August of 1830 in what became known as the July Monarchy after the July Revolution, also known as the Second French Revolution, or Three Glorious Days, forced his cousin, King Charles V, to abdicate, and the Bourbon monarch was replaced by the Duke of Orléans. In the French constitutional monarchy of King Louis-Philippe I, the principle of hereditary right was replaced by popular sovereignty, the principle that the authority of a state and its government are created and sustained by the consent of its people, who are the source of all political power. The July column in the Place de la Bastille, an elaborate Corinthian column, was said to have been designed and directed to commemorate King Louis-Philippe I's accession to the French throne as a result of the July Revolution. The July Column reminds me of the tallest freestanding Corinthian column in the world, which is the Grand Avenue Water Tower in St. Louis, Missouri, said to have been built in 1871. 
King Louis-Philippe I was later forced to abdicate as a result of the French Revolution of 1848. I found these different portraits of King Louis-Philippe I on the Internet, with his skin complexion changing from light to dark. The French Revolution of 1848 led to the foundation of the short-lived Second French Republic under the elected president Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte, the nephew of Napoleon, which became the Second French Empire starting in 1852 when Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte staged a coup d'etat and became Emperor Napoleon III. It was during the Second French Empire and the reign of Napoleon III that the railroad system was said to have been developed using Paris as a hub and that Paris was turned into a world-class showpiece. So much for popular sovereignty until the establishment of the French Third Republic in September of 1870. More on what was going on in 1870 and 1871 to follow later. The 1830 revolution in France sparked an uprising in August of 1830 in Brussels and the southern provinces of the Netherlands that led to separation and the establishment of the Kingdom of Belgium and Leopold, the son of Duke Francis of Saxe Coburg Saalfeld, became King Leopold I, the first king of the Belgians, in 1831. King Leopold I was said to play an important role in the creation of Belgium's first railroad in 1835 and subsequent industrialization. His father, Francis, Duke of Saxe Coburg Saalfeld, was born in July of 1750 and was the progenitor of the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha line which ceded the lineage of the new royals. Francis succeeded his father, Duke Ernest Frederick, as the reigning Duke of Saxe Coburg Saalfeld in 1800. King Leopold I of Belgium had strong ties to Great Britain, as he had moved there and married Princess Charlotte of Wales in 1816, second in line to the British throne, after her father, the Prince Regent, who became King George IV. She was recorded as having died after delivering a stillborn child a year after they were married, leaving King George IV without any legitimate grandchildren. Baron Stockmar of Coburg was the personal physician of Leopold I at the time of his marriage to Princess Charlotte and stayed on as his private secretary, comptroller of the household, and political advisor, and later a very important and influential advisor of Victoria and Albert. As King George III's son, the Prince Regent George's brother, Prince Edward, ended up proposing to Leopold I's older sister, Victoria, of Saxe Coburg Saalfeld, who were the parents of the future Queen Victoria. Through Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, who were first cousins, the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha continued to cede all of the new royal houses of Europe. Thus, one German ducal line ended up taking over the whole shebang. And on that note, on July 17th of 1917, during the reign of King George V, the name of the royal house was changed to Windsor from Saxe Coburg and Gotha for the given reason of anti German sentiment generated by World War I. Back to King Leopold. King Leopold I remarried on August 9th of 1832, this time to Louise Marie of Orleans, eldest daughter of King Louis Philippe I of France, and 22 years younger than Leopold. As a member of the reigning house of Orleans, Louise Marie was entitled to the rank of a princess of the royal blood, legitimately descended in a male line from a sovereign. They had four children, including King Leopold II of Belgium and Empress Carlotta of Mexico. Queen Louise Marie died from tuberculosis in October of 1850, and King Leopold died 15 years later in 1865. They are buried together in the royal crypt at the Church of Our Lady of Laken in Brussels a church said to have been commissioned by King Leopold I in Queen Louise Marie's memory, with the building of it starting in 1854, first consecrated in 1872, and finally completed in 1909. The revolutions of 1830 in France and Belgium marked the beginning of a revolutionary wave of romantic nationalism in Europe, inspired in part by Hegelian philosophy which had the aim of removing the old monarchical structures and creating independent nation-states. The revolutions of 1848 was the most widespread revolutionary wave in Europe's history, affecting 50 countries. At the beginning of the year, all of the great powers on the continent were monarchies, and in February, word of the uprising in Paris that led to the collapse of the July monarchy of King Louis-Philippe I spread through all of Europe's liberal circles as a signal for action. 
Many of the revolutions were quickly suppressed, and the revolutions were most important in France, the Netherlands, Italy, the Austrian Empire, and the states of the German Confederation. Not only does it appear that the different revolutions of 1848 were aimed at bringing down the once stable hereditary ruling houses of the ancient regime and replacing them with the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha bloodline, the year of 1848 has been called the year that created immigrant America, in part due to the 1848 revolutions, where Germans seeking to escape the political unrest went and had the wherewithal to buy farmland and start businesses as well as the immigration due to the European potato failure, which brought the Irish in large numbers, and the Chinese who arrived because of the Daoguang Depression and economic hardship in China, both of which worked for low wages and menial labor and provided the labor pool to work on infrastructure. Was chaos being used as a destabilization element to create something new? I think this process of creating chaos to destabilize the status quo has been going on for quite some time and seems never-ending, even in today's world. Now I want to introduce how I think the New World Order timeline was constructed. I was drawn several years ago to consider the years of 1492, the year of the fall of Granada and the Moors in Spain, and the first voyage to the New World of Christopher Columbus, and 1942, the mid-year of World War II, as boundary years for a new timeline that was somehow inserted over Earth's original history and I have researched extensively into what was going on in our historical narrative between these two years. There are 450 years between 1492 and 1942, and at 225 years, the midpoint year is 1717. There were nine 50-year periods between 1492 and 1942, and when I researched events that happened in the 40, 41, 42, and 90, 91, 92 years between 1492 and 1942, I found a lot of significant historical events in our narrative. Additionally, I have found a lot of historical activity being initiated at 20-year intervals. So, for example, in 1810, 1830, 1850, 1870, 1890, and so on. For the purposes of the subject of this video, I'm going to look at some specific happenings going on during and around the midpoint year of 1717 and then focus on what was going on around 1871. The Premier Grand Lodge of England was founded in London on June 24th of 1717, considered the first Masonic Grand Lodge to be created. Originally called the Grand Lodge of London and Westminster, it soon became the Grand Lodge of England. Nathan Mayer Rothschild, the bringer of the Rothschild Bank to London, and son of banker Mayer Amschel Rothschild of Frankfurt, became a Freemason in the Emulation Lodge No. 12 of the Premier Grand Lodge of England in October of 1802. During the Napoleonic Wars between 1803 and 1815, Nathan Mayer Rothschild became Britain's banker and paymaster on the continent, which contributed to the Duke of Wellington's defeat of Napoleon and consolidated the basis of the financial dynasty of the Rothschilds. By the time of his death in 1836, Nathan Mayer Rothschild had secured the position of the Rothschilds as the preeminent investment bankers in Britain and Europe, and his own personal net worth was over 60% of the British national income. The Masonic Anno Lucius calendar, which translates from Latin to in the year of the light, and added 4,000 years to the Gregorian calendar, was adopted by the brothers of the United Grand Lodge of England in 1717. The Anno Lucius calendar was based on the modification of the Anno Mundi, a calendar created in 1658 by Irish Anglican Bishop James Usher, who believed he had calculated the exact date of God's creation of the world by correlating biblical accounts with those in Hebrew genealogy, Middle Eastern history, and other events. Bishop Usher came up with the date of October 28th of 4004 BC in the Gregorian calendar as that date. The Gregorian calendar was introduced by Pope Gregory XIII in October of 1582 for the given reason of correcting the Julian calendar on stopping the drift of the calendar with respect to the equinoxes and included the addition of leap years. The Gregorian calendar was introduced just one year before the publication of Joseph Justice Scaliger's work in 1583 called The Work on the Amendment of Time, 
establishing the new chronology by investigating ancient systems of determining epochs, calendars, and computations of time, and synchronizing all of ancient history into two major works, the other one being called the Thesaurus Temporum in 1606. During the 1582 to 1589 time period, in England, John Dee and Edward Kelly were involved in scrying activities that ended up bringing fallen angels and other negative beings into this dimensional plane. John Dee was considered the most learned man of his time in England and had an extensive library. He also had in his possession a collection of mirrors and other scrying devices. He was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. Edward Kelly was an occultist and spirit medium. I mention this because it is my belief that this could be very relevant to what has been going on here. There is an occultist element associated with dark arts that came directly into England with Dean Kelly that is very problematic to this day. I was recently researching Puritan leader John Winthrop because he is one of the statues representing Massachusetts in the National Statuary Hall. He was a Puritan leader who was a major player in the 1630 establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony the second religious colony after the establishment of the 1620 Plymouth Colony. There were several things that struck me in the story of John Winthrop's life. One was that the Winthrop family was granted lordship of Groton Manor after the dissolution of the monasteries, as the lord of the manor had previously been the abbot of the Bury St. Edmund's Abbey. The dissolution of the monasteries took place between 1536 and 1541, in which King Henry VIII disbanded the approximately 850 monasteries, convents, and friaries in England, and leaving zero. Their income was taken and assets disposed of, and in many cases, like that of Glastonbury Abbey, the buildings on the property were left in ruins. The Winthrop coat of arms was confirmed to John's uncle by the College of Arms in 1592. The College of Arms was said to have been first incorporated as a royal corporation in March of 1484 under King Richard III, and then reincorporated in 1555 under Queen Mary I of England. Heralds are appointed by the British monarch and delegated to act on behalf of the crown in all matters of heraldry, besides the granting of new coats of arms, including genealogical research and the granting of pedigrees. During King Henry VIII's reign, it was said that the College of Arms At no time since its establishment was the college in higher estimation, nor in fuller employment than in this reign. In 1530, King Henry VIII conferred the duty of heraldic visitation on the college, that of tours of inspection between 1530 and 1688 around England, Wales, and Ireland to register and regulate the coats of arms of nobility, gentry, and boroughs, and to record pedigrees. During the time of the dissolution of the monasteries between 1536 and 1541, this duty gained even more importance as the monasteries were formerly the repositories of local genealogical records, and from then on the college was responsible for the recording and maintenance of genealogical records. The College of Arms has been on Queen Victoria Street in the City of London in the shadow of St. Paul's Cathedral since 1555. This is the coat of arms for the College of Arms, with the motto, Diligent and Secret, which, interestingly, the heraldry wiki doesn't know the meaning of. Could it possibly mean exactly what it says, diligent and secret? Like, we don't want you to know something, but we are sure working hard at what we're doing. So if you're going to switch out the old nobility with the new nobility, this would be a way to do it. Destroy the old genealogical records in the monasteries and create new ones diligently and secretly. This would explain a question I am often asked, how to explain something like a mud flood event and repopulation effort involving a lot of orphans when some people have long genealogies in their families, and I'm one of them, with long genealogies in my family lines, including ancestors on the Mayflower on one side. Yet my husband's family got the name Gibson from an orphan ancestor after the Civil War that worked in Texas for a man named Gibson, and he took his name and settled in western Oklahoma after driving cattle there. Another thing that struck me was finding out that the records of all four ends of court in London, Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, Inner Temple, and Middle Temple, were lost, and the exact dates of their founding unknown. The ends of court educate and train barristers to be called to the bar and able to practice law in England and Wales. The current history of Gray's Inn, where John Winthrop studied, began in 1569. Lincoln's Inn was formally organized as a place of legal education in 1580, the Middle Temple and Inner Temple both around the same time in 1573. 
does this information signify perhaps the beginnings of a new legal system? The origin of the term bar apparently comes from the barring furniture in the courtroom that separates spectators and the participants of a trial. This is another thing that struck me in researching the life of John Winthrop. Our historical narrative tells us the religious atmosphere for Puritans started to change in England in the mid to late 1620s, after King Charles I ascended to the throne in 1625 and had married a Roman Catholic. There was an atmosphere of intolerance towards Puritans, and this state of affairs led Puritan leaders to consider immigration to the New World as a means to escape persecution. For the Puritans leaving England for the New World because of religious intolerance, completely uprooting their lives and venturing into the unknown for religious freedom, they were remarkably intolerant of people with other religious beliefs, including those within their own community. The antinomian controversy significantly divided the Massachusetts Bay Colony from October of 1636 to March of 1638. It pitted most of the colony's ministers and magistrates against some of the adherents of the free grace theology of Puritan minister John Cotton and revolved around a theological debate concerning Cotton's covenant of grace, which taught that following religious laws was not required for salvation, and the covenant of works of other Puritans, including John Winthrop, which taught that by doing good works and obeying the law, a person earns and merits salvation. The outcome was that the leading advocates of antinomianism, Anne Hutchison and John Wheelwright, were banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and their supporters were disarmed, dismissed, disenfranchised, or banished in this new world. Something similar took place after the Revolutionary War when the United States had gained its independence from Great Britain. Shays' Rebellion took place in rural western Massachusetts from August of 1786 to February of 1787 in response to a debt crisis amongst the people and in opposition to the state government's increased efforts to collect taxes on individuals and their trades. Residents in these areas had few assets beyond their land and bartered with each other for goods and services, as opposed to the market economy of the developed areas of the Massachusetts Bay and the Connecticut River Valley. It was led by Revolutionary War veteran Daniel Shays, who led 4,000 rebels in protest against economic and civil rights injustices, where founders like Samuel Adams approved of rebellion against an unrepresentative government. Adams opposed the taking up of arms against a Republican form of government, where he believed problems should be remedied through elections. He urged the then governor of Massachusetts, James Bowdoin, to put down the uprising using military force, so he sent 4,000 militiamen to quell the uprising. Then there was the Whiskey Rebellion that began four years after Shays' Rebellion. The Whiskey Tax was the first tax imposed on a domestic product by the newly formed federal government and was intended to generate revenue for the war debt brought about by the Revolutionary War and primarily affected people living in rural areas, like farmers in the new country's western frontier, who turned surplus grains into alcohol and where whiskey was used for bartering. The Whiskey Rebellion was a violent tax protest in the United States that started in 1791 and ended in 1794 during George Washington's presidency and when George Washington himself led 13,000 militiamen provided by Virginia, Maryland, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania to put down the insurgency. However, all the insurgents left before the army arrived, effectively ending the rebellion and resulting in a handful of arrests of individuals that were later acquitted or pardoned. The Whiskey Rebellion demonstrated that the new national government had the will and ability to suppress violent resistance to its laws. So it's okay to do one thing when you're rebelling against an oppressive system imposed from the outside, but it's not okay to rebel the new, better system once it's in place. It just seems contradictory. The last thing that really got my attention was the use of the word plantation and planting of the new settlements in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the region that became known as New England. This map was the illustration that appeared opposite the title page of William Wood's book from that time entitled New England's Prospect and called A True, Lively, and Experimental Description of That Part of America Commonly Called New England, Discovering the State of That Country both as it stands to our new-come English planters and to the old native inhabitants, laying down that which might enrich the knowledge of the mind-traveling reader or benefit the future voyager. We are told that in its early months, the new Massachusetts Bay Colony struggled, losing around 200 people to various diseases. Winthrop worked alongside the laborers and servants in the work of the colony, 
setting an example for the other colonists to do all the work that needed to be done on the plantation. Interesting to see the word plantation used so much even from the very beginnings of the New World, because we usually see it in association with the vast agricultural estates of places like, but not limited to, the southern United States. In the early history of colonialism, plantation was a form of colonization where settlers would establish a permanent or semi-permanent settlement in a new region, literally planting themselves in a new place. Not only were settlements and settlers being planted in a new region from somewhere else, this plantation system of the colonizers quickly laid the foundation for large-scale slavery on big farms owned by planters where vast quantities of cash crops like cotton, sugarcane, tobacco, and so on were produced. Actual human slavery not only seeded the dialectic of master and slave philosophized about by Hegel into physical form, it laid the foundations for things like turning the old world order upside down, artificial racial divisions, and the fostering of racial prejudice. It also provided the stated reasons for the American Civil War in the historical narrative which supposedly ended slavery in the United States. The word plantation first started appearing in the late 1500s to describe the process of colonization, like the plantations of Ireland in the 16th and 17th centuries, during which time we are told the crown confiscated land from the Irish Catholics and redistributed the land to Protestant settlers, creating all kinds of long-term problems. The plantations of Ireland replaced the Irish language, law, and customs with those of the British and created sectarian hatred between Protestants and Catholics. In the 20th century, Ireland was partitioned on May 3rd of 1921 when the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland divided Ireland into two home rule territories, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland with the stated goal of remaining within the United Kingdom and eventually reunifying. Northern Ireland remained part of the United Kingdom, but after the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December of 1921, Southern Ireland dropped out of the United Kingdom and became the Irish Free State. The partition of Ireland took place around the Irish War of Independence, a guerrilla conflict between the Irish Republican Army and British Army forces between 1920 and 1922 during which time the partition occurred, there was violence in Northern Ireland in defense or opposition to the new settlement, and its capital Belfast saw savage and unprecedented violent riots between Protestant and Catholic civilians. All of this led directly to the Troubles, a period of unrest and violence that escalated across Northern Ireland between the Irish Catholic Nationalist and Irish Protestant Unionist between 1969 and 1998 more examples of creating chaos to destabilize the status quo and sow violence and hatred between the same people based on a form of violence in which the violent parties feel solidarity for their respective groups and victims of violence are chosen based on their group membership. In between the introduction of the Gregorian calendar in 1582 and the introduction of the Anno Lucius calendar in 1717, John Milton's epic poem Paradise Lost was published in London in 1667, which I view as historical nonfiction and the original predictive programming, which is defined as storylines or subtle images that in retrospect seem to hint at events that actually end up happening in the real world. As related in the poem, newly banished fallen angels organize, and Lucifer volunteers to corrupt the newly created earth and God's new and most favored creation, mankind. Lucifer goes to the Garden of Eden and convinces Eve by duplicity to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, leading to their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Who is Lucifer? Lucifer is translated from the Hebrew word that means brightness, and this designation is the rendering of the morning star or bright star, which is presented in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Isaiah chapter 13 and 14 go on to say, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. What is Luciferianism? It is a belief system said to venerate the essential characteristics that are affixed to Lucifer revering Lucifer not as the devil or enemy of God, 
but as a guardian or liberator, bringing light and guiding spirit to darkness, or even the true God. But what we have been having to deal with here on earth is anything but light and goodness, quite the opposite. The earth's would-be controllers disguise their true intentions by positive-sounding words while they go about their final solution to implement a truly dystopian future for all life on earth in the form of a new world order where Lucifer is installed as the Most High, and they are in complete control forever. A year after Milton's Paradise Lost was published in 1667, John Amos Comenius, a Czech philosopher and theologian who is considered by some to have been the father of modern education, published the Via Lucis in 1668. I did a deep dive on Comenius back in 2020 after somebody sent me a publication about his life and asked me to take a look at it, and in the process of doing so, I learned a lot about how the reset timeline was constructed. In the Via Lucis, Comenius outlined his recommendations for the improvement of humanity through Pansophy, or all-encompassing knowledge into one amalgamation of all sciences through a union of knowledge of alchemy and magic with divine wisdom. He advocated for a new world language, for scholars from all nations to take place in this global reform, and a Collegium Lucius, or Collegium of Light, based in London, to coordinate all of this activity to overcome the world's misery, ignorance, confusion, and war. What really stood out most for me here, first of all, was seeing the words, a new world language. Because of all the world's languages, the one which qualifies as an international language is English. And then seeing the words involving a union of alchemy and magic. And there is good reason to believe these two subjects are related. This is what we are told about modern English. It is the form of English spoken since the Great Vowel Ship, a systematic change in the pronunciation of vowels for which the causes in England are unknown, which began in the 1400s and was completed around 1550. Texts from the early 1600s, like the King James Bible and the works of William Shakespeare, are considered to be early modern English. With the works of Shakespeare said to have single-handedly changed the English language of this time, with things like a huge vocabulary of 34,000 words and 2,000 new words. With the colonization done by the British Empire, English was adopted as a primary or secondary language around the world. Is there magic embedded in the modern English language? I will point out the simplest examples that I can think of to demonstrate that, yes, it is. The first example is the word spell. One meaning of the word spell is a series of words that has magical powers, like an incantation, or being under a magical spell, when what you do is out of your control. The word spell in English also means reciting the letters in a word, as in spelling a word, or how do you spell that word? Then there is the English word grammar. Grammar is defined as the whole system and structure of a language in general. There is an etymological connection between the French and the English word for what we know as grammar and the French word grimoire. A grimoire is a book of magical spells and all things related. Was there Western European alchemy in Shakespeare? Apparently so. I was first clued into Shakespeare and alchemy in the research for my last video on John Winthrop when I saw this book about his son. John Winthrop, Jr., who was an early governor of Connecticut, called Prospero's America. Prospero was a sorcerer in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. Now moving forward in time a bit, the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati was founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt was born in 1748 in Ingolstadt, Bavaria, Germany. He went to a Jesuit school at the age of seven and was initiated into Freemasonry in 1777. Weishaupt fled to the Duchy of Saxe-Gotha, Altenburg, under the protection of Duke Ernest II, starting in 1784, when his radical views on Illuminism got him in trouble with the ruler in Bavaria, after writings of his were intercepted and deemed seditious. I wonder if the 1776 at the base of the pyramid on the Great Seal of the United States refers to the year the American Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th, or the year the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati was founded, or perhaps both. It is important to note that the original Illuminati 
or illuminated ones, were dedicated spiritual practitioners who achieved the rainbow body in which the practitioner is able to transform the physical body into a rarefied state of light through an extremely high level of self-realization. Living traditions like that of Tibetan Buddhism have retained the knowledge of how to achieve this spiritual state on an individual basis. But the ancient culture of Lemuria, which supported these ancient practices as a collective in Tibet, was destroyed starting in 1950 by the invasion and occupation of Tibet by communist China. Since that time, it is estimated that over a million Tibetans have been killed, with monks, nuns, and lay people who protest ending up as political prisoners who are tortured and held in substandard conditions. And that approximately 6,000 monasteries, nunneries, and temples were destroyed in Tibet starting in 1959, just like what happened in King Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries back in the 1500s. Interesting to note here that the following happened around the same time in our historical narrative as the dissolution of the monasteries, which took place between 1536 and 1541. In 1540, a papal bull issued by Pope Paul III established the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, under the leadership of Ignatius Loyola, and included a special vow of obedience to the Pope in matters of mission direction and assignment. In 1542, Pope Paul III also established the Holy Office, also known as the Inquisition, and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And in May of 1543, Nicholas Copernicus published On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, offering mathematical arguments for the heliocentric or sun-centered universe and denying the geocentric model of the earth-centered universe of Ptolemy. And the once widely accepted geocentric model of the universe was henceforth no longer considered adequate. Copernicus's universe-changing book was published shortly before his death on May 24th of 1543. Back to China in Tibet, Communist China has a policy of resettlement of Chinese citizens to Tibet. Chinese is the official language, and Tibetans have become a minority in their own country. Just like the early colonial process of plantation, and still going on in the 20th century. The playbook doesn't change, just the place and time. Now I'm going to start looking at what was going on in the 1870 and 1871 period of time in our historical narrative, because a number of noteworthy events stand out. To start with, I first found Karl Marx and the Communards doing the deep dive on Comenius that I referenced earlier. I was looking up days and dates connected with Comenius, including his birth date of March 28th of 1592. I found a lot of information about a lot of things from this process but I want to specifically mention one historical event I found on his birthday of March 28th. The short-lived Paris Commune was formally established on March 28th of 1871, a radical, socialist, anti-religious, and revolutionary government that ruled Paris until it was suppressed by the French army in May of 1871. What happened in the Paris Commune was closely followed by London resident Karl Marx. He published a pamphlet in June of 1871 called The Civil War in France about the significance of the struggle of the communards in the Paris Commune. And something I just learned now is that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published their Communist Manifesto regarding as the founding documents of communism in the revolutionary year of 1848 that I mentioned previously in this video. And was Marx a Freemason? Apparently so, along with Giuseppe Mazzini who I will be bringing up shortly along with Albert Pike. And Vladimir Lenin, the first and founding head of Soviet Russia from 1917 to 1924, and of the Soviet Union from 1922 to 1924. Under his administration, Russia and then the Soviet Union became a one-party socialist state governed by the Communist Party. John D. Rockefeller, along with Henry Flagler, an American industrialist and a major developer in the state of Florida, founded the Standard Oil Company in 1870, becoming an American oil-producing, transporting, refining, and marketing company, and monopoly, which exists when a specific person or enterprise is the only supplier of a particular commodity. The American Masonic Society Shriners International was established in 1870, and headquartered in Tampa, Florida.
In 1871, Otto von Bismarck was the mastermind behind the unification of Germany and served as its first chancellor until 1890. Bismarck unified Germany by provoking three short, decisive wars with Denmark, Austria, and France, and by abolishing the supranational German Confederation, an association of 39 German-speaking states in Central Europe that was created by the Congress of Vienna to replace the former Holy Roman Empire and formed the German Empire, which excluded Austria, which was a major beef of the Austrian Adolf Hitler. The Second French Empire ended with the capture of Emperor Napoleon III and defeat of the French military forces in the Franco-Prussian War that lasted a little over six months from July 19th of 1870 to January 28th of 1871. The Siege of Paris started in September of 1870, resulting in the capture of the city by the military forces of Prussia and the North German Confederation. This is an illustration of Prussian troops marching past the Arc du Triomphe in Paris during the Franco-Prussian War. The Franco-Prussian War led directly to the brief establishment, starting in March of 1871, of the Paris Commune in its aftermath. Some believe that Bismarck manipulated the situation by dispatching the Ems telegram on July 14th of 1870, inciting the Second French Empire to declare war on the Kingdom of Prussia five days later, on July 19th. Bismarck annexed Alsace-Lorraine on the border with Germany, which was part of France, as a result of the Franco-Prussian War. France's determination to regain Alsace-Lorraine and fear of another Franco-German war, as well as British apprehension about the balance of power, became factors in the causes of World War I. By not including Austria in the German Confederation and annexing France's Alsace-Lorraine, Bismarck set the stage for both World War I and World War II. The Criminal Tribes Act was enacted by the British in India on October 12th of 1871 and wasn't ended until 1949. The Criminal Tribes Act of 1871 criminalized entire communities by designating them as habitual criminals, and restrictions on their movements were imposed, including men having to report to the police once per week. This included tribes like the Bill Minas of Udapur, the ruling tribe there before the Rajputs, otherwise known as the Miwar Kingdom, forced them to hide out in the Aravali Hills, and they were named a criminal tribe by the British government in 1924 to keep them from regaining power. The Bill Minas were subsequently given protection as a scheduled tribe after the upliftment of the Criminal Tribe Act in 1949. A scheduled tribe is recognized by the Indian Constitution, has political representation, and yet they are legally, totally, or partially excluded from various types of services important for leading a healthy life. And altogether, the scheduled tribes of India make up almost 10% of the population and are considered India's poorest people. The last Mughal emperor in India, Bahadur Shah Zafar, was deposed by the British East India Company in 1858 and exiled. Through the Government of India Act of 1858, the British Crown assumed direct control of the British East India Company-held territories in India in the form of the new British Raj. In 1876, Queen Victoria assumed the title of Empress of India. King Emperor and Queen Empress were the titles used by the British monarchs in India between 1876 and 1948. The U.S. Congress passed the District of Columbia Organic Act in 1871, which repealed the charters of the cities of Washington and Georgetown and established a new territorial government for the District of Columbia. This created a single municipal government for the federal district, which was incorporated, defined as the process of constituting a company, city, or other organization as a legal corporation. Thus, the 1871 U.S. Corporation was born, which opened the door for ownership by foreign interests. The unification process of Italy, known as the Risorgimento, started with the revolutions of 1848 in Italy and was completed in 1870 and 1871. The Kingdom of Italy was created in 1861, when King Victor Emmanuel II of Sardinia was proclaimed king of the different states on the Italian peninsula, consolidated into a single state. Italy declared war on Austria in alliance with Prussia in 1866, and Italy received the region of Veneto, which was part of the Austrian Empire, after defeating them. 
Italian troops entered Rome on September 20th of 1870, which marked the final defeat of the Papal States under Pope Pius IX and resulted in the unification of the Italian peninsula, with the exception of San Marino, under the Kingdom of Italy and the establishment of Rome as its capital city. The following three quotes that appear to be the military blueprint for three world wars were said to have been contained in a letter written by Albert Pike to Giuseppe Mazzini in 1871. For the First World War, Pike was talking about the Illuminati overthrowing the Tsars and making Russia a fortress of atheistic communism in the same year Karl Marx first wrote about communism with regards to the Paris Commune. Coincidence? For the Second World War, he talked about taking advantage of the differences between fascists and Zionists, destroying Nazism, Zionism creating Israel, and communism being strong enough to control Christendom. And for the Third World War, the Illuminati taking advantage of the differences between Zionist and Islamic leaders so they mutually destroy each other. Sound familiar? Could all of these conflicts, at least since the American Civil War and maybe even the Crimean War and other wars of the 19th century, been planned, even scripted out, for the controller's desired outcome, which was world control and domination? Order out of chaos? Giuseppe Mazzini, to whom Pike had written the letter, had taken over the leadership of the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati in 1834. Mazzini founded a political movement for Italian youth under age 40 in 1831 and sent his right-hand men, Adriano Lemmy and Louis Kossuth, to the United States to organize Young America lodges based on the same ideas. The Young America movement became a faction of the Democratic Party in the 1850s. I started thinking about doing a video specifically on the year 1871 a couple of weeks ago when I was doing research on Louisiana's Edward Douglas White for the National Statuary Hall at the U.S. Capitol Building. Edward Douglas White was the ninth Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He was reported as having served on the reception committee in 1877 of the Knights of Momus in New Orleans. The year of 1871 was the first year Mardi Gras was celebrated on a grand scale in Galveston, Texas, and was when the Mardi Gras crews of the Knights of Momus and the Knights of Myth emerged, both of which devised night parades, masked balls, exquisite costumes, and elaborate invitations, as when the Knights of Momus, led by prominent Galvestonians, decorated horse-drawn wagons for a torch-lit night parade. Named for Momus, the personification of mockery, satire, and ridicule in Greek mythology, the Knights of Momus has operated continuously as a secret society in New Orleans since its founding there in 1872, the same year the New Orleans Mardi Gras Parade was founded. The New Orleans Knights of Momus withdrew from participating in the Mardi Gras Parade in 1991 after an ordinance was passed that required all social organizations, including Mardi Gras crews, to certify publicly that they did not discriminate on the basis of race, gender, handicap, or sexual orientation, to obtain parade permits and other public licensure. Operating continuously since its founding, the Knights of Momus still hold an annual ball mask at the Orpheum Theater on the Thursday before Mardi Gras. When I saw this, Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut came to mind. And what do masks actually signify? Do they signify something benign? or something including our true selves that is being hidden from us, or a way of being that has been secretly imposed on us. Like I mentioned, the ball mask in New Orleans is held at the Orpheum Theater. Orpheum Theaters were, and still are, found around the world. Just like Momus was the personification of mockery, satire, and ridicule in Greek mythology, Orpheus, a musician and poet in Greek mythology, was said to have had the ability to charm all living things and even stones with his music. What exactly caused us to go to sleep and forget who we are and what we were? How has the false information we have been taught in school been reinforced? Why would this be important to whoever was responsible for removing the ancient advanced civilization from our collective awareness to begin with? What is Mardi Gras best known for besides king cake? and beads. Modern Mardi Gras celebrations include debauchery and drunkenness, featuring elaborate masks and costumes, in the spirit of letting go and having fun before the sacrifices and fasting of the season of Lent. 
all just in the name of having a good time, right? Well, maybe that's the intent of the party goers, but is there a hidden hand at work here? And was the celebration always of this nature? I don't think it was. Why go through all this trouble? They have to have our consent because of our free will. The beings behind this went through all of the trouble to do all of this because in a free will zone like Earth, the human beings who live here have to give their consent to choose whether to follow the light or the dark. It was rigged to benefit them and not for our best interest in order to maintain power and control over humanity. The negative beings behind all of this wanted to set up a new god as lord of this world and wanted a proxy vote for their hostile takeover. They wanted to persuade enough of humanity to voluntarily accept Lucifer over the creator of the universe. The only way they can accomplish this acceptance, however, is by outright lies, deception, and duplicity because if people knew the true agenda of these controllers, the majority of humanity would never ever accept this. The controllers of this world have tricked us into worshiping them and have kept our consent for this system by lying to us about its existence. I believe that these beings with a negative agenda devised this complicated plan to knock humanity off the positive, ancient, advanced, Moorish timeline of higher consciousness in an interdimensional war in order to control humanity, using humans as their tools against the Creator and creation. I want to end this by saying I don't believe the world's elitist controllers will get away with what they have done and that their day of reckoning is just around the corner.